Okay, thank you for the invitation to talk. Uh, my talk today is, is uh, titled The Entropy Current in Hydrodynamics, Superfluid Hydrodynamics and Gravity. Um, the talk will be mainly about the relationship between the equations of uh, gravity and the landau tisa style uh, equations of superfluidity. Um, but um, we'll end with some speculative remarks um, about, about, about perhaps a more fundamental subject. Okay, uh, my talk is based uh, largely on two papers that I've written in collaboration with my uh, ex-student Shantani Bhattacharya, my current student Jyotirmoy Bhattacharya, and uh, a postdoc in Princeton called Amos Yarom. And uh, uh, there are several uh, rele relevant references to what I'm going to be talking about, but uh, four of the most relevant have been listed uh, here. Okay, so before I really start on the talk, let me tell you what I'm going to be doing, mainly in the non-speculative part. Okay, um, so in this talk, uh, I will present to you the most e general equations of S-wave superfluid hydrodynamics at first order in uh, a systematic derivative expansion. Subjects to the, subject to the constraints of symmetry and uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the constraints coming from the second law of thermodynamics and one or two other physically reasonable constraints. Now, um, although superfluid hydrodynamics is a very old subject, it's, it was studied first in the 1940s and 50s, has been continuously studied ever since, um, I, I believe that this question has never completely and correctly been, addre uh, been uh, um, addressed before, okay? So just the structure of the equations of superfluid hydrodynamics, including dissipative effects, while there are several claims about these structures in the literature, I believe none of them are complete and, and uh, correct yet. And so, okay, so this is what the talk is going to be about. Um, now, I approach the subject um, through performing several calculations uh, that reveal the structure of the um, equations of superfluid fluid hydrodynamics within uh, what's sometimes called the fluid ga gravity correspondence, of, uh, fluid gravity correspondence that sits within the ADS-CFT correspondence. And I'm gonna start my talk with a, a review of this correspondence. Okay, now uh, the structure of my talk is going to be as follows. Uh, everything new that I'm going to say is about superfluid hydrodynamics. But the calculations that, uh, uh, that we needed to perform in order to uncover this new structure were, were, very, uh, uh, were very extensive, and I can't review those calculations here, just for lack of time. However, all the principles we used um, are revealed in a simpler structure, namely in trying to understand the most general structure of ordinary hydrodynamics. So I'm going to, in the first part of this talk, tell you about uh, how you can constrain the structure of ordinary hydrodynamics. This is a simple calculation, I can give you all details. And then finally, just tell you, in the second part, I'll just tell you the results that you get for super, superfluid hydrodynamics using the same principles, uh, though a lot more algebra. Okay, so let me start. So I'm gonna start by reviewing the fluid gravity map of fluid gra gravity correspondence that sits within ADS-CFT. Uh, and I'll do this very briefly. Um, so five-dimensional negative cosmological constant Einstein-Maxwell gravity admits a five-parameter set of very well-known Ryzen and Nordstrom black brain solutions. These solutions are black brains, so they're translationally invariant. And uh, they're five parameters. They're characterized by an energy density or a temperature, a charge density or a chemical potential. And finally, um, uh, a four-velocity, which being normalized to minus one, has three parameters in it. Okay, so it represents stuff in equilibrium at some energy density and some charge density and moving with any speed that you want. Okay, this is of course very well known, but there's something interesting about it. You know, it's a common fact in, in physics that when you've got a set of solutions labeled by a, a, a set of parameters and you've got some sort of approximate locality in your system, then you can try to generate many new solutions to the equations by promoting the parameters to fields. This is the basic idea behind the Goldstone philosophy, collective coordinate philosophy, okay? So you could try to run that program uh, with these Ryzen and Nordstrom black brain solutions, okay? You could 
uh, try to promote the velocity, which was a parameter of these brains, to a field, a local field. The temperature, which was a parameter of these solutions, to a local field. Similarly for the chemical potential. And it's an interesting fact, one that I reviewed in a string talk two or three years ago, that uh, this program can be, uh, at least for simple bulk equations like just the Einstein-Maxwell system, can be, carried out in, uh, can be carried out in a systematic derivative expansion in great detail. Um, that for every, so in particular, for every field configuration, u mu of x, t of x, and mu of x, subject to a certain equation of motion, which we'll come to in a little bit, um, there is a solution to the bulk equations of motion. You can generate the sol a solution to the bulk equations of motion order by order in an expansion of derivatives of the field divided by roughly the temperature, the local value of the temperature. And that these bulk solutions, these solutions of the Einstein-Maxwell system, can be um, explicitly constructed, as I, as I said in, uh, sorry, in this, in, in, the, in the systematic expansion in derivative by temperature. These have, for simple bulk equations, let's say the Einstein-Maxwell system, these have been constructed explicitly up to second order in the derivative expansion, and there's no, ba there's no apparent barrier to going to 27th order, if you were so interested. Okay, now an interesting and for my talk completely crucial aspect of these solutions is that these solutions were constructed, um, and this was an important boundary con condition in the whole process of this construction, they were constructed to have regular future event horizons. And as you will see as we go along in this talk, this is very important. Okay, now any asymptotically ADS uh, as any asymptotically ADS solution with a gravity and a gauge field uh, has associated with it um, a boundary stress tensor and uh, a boundary charge current. This is a purely gravitational fact, but uh, was also, of course, a consistency requirement of the ADS CFT correspondence. And the dictionary relating a given solution to the stress tensor and currents are well known. So I've told you that we had. Um, uh, these solutions parameterized by a velocity field, a temperature field, and a chemical potential field. So a question you could ask is, what is the structure of the boundary stress tensor and the charge current for these solutions? And the structure of uh, turns out to be the following. The stress tensor is given um, by the pressure plus energy, so energy density plus pressure times u mu times u nu plus pressure this is just of the equilibrium black brain solution. So the pressure, energy density, and okay, and the charge current is given by the charge density times u mu. And then there are corrections, which we'll come to in a moment. These first parts, ignoring the corrections, just come from thermodynamics, just come from the equilibrium black brain solutions. Okay? But they're corrected by corrections that depend on derivatives of the, uh, of the fields of the problem. So derivatives of the temperature field, derivative of the chemical potential field, and derivative of the velocity fields. Okay, and uh, uh, so when I say the charge, charge density, energy density, and pressure here, what I mean is the the objects that, as as determined as functions of the temperature and chemical potential from uniform black brain solutions or from thermodynamics. Okay, these corrections are not determined just by thermodynamics. In order to determine the corrections, you need to implement this fluid gravity map systematically order by order in a derivative expansion. And uh, if you implement this map to mth order in that derivative expansion, you'd be able to derive the corrections to the stress tensor and the corrections to the charge current to the same order in that expansion. Okay. So this program in particular gives you an expansion of the stress tensor and charge currents in um, powers in, in as a function of derivatives of the thermodynamical fields, order by order in a derivative expansion, up to the order to which you carry out this expansion. Okay, now, it is, of course, a well-known fact in, in, within the ADS-CFT correspondence of in the study of asymptotically ADS gravity, that these boundary stress tensors and currents are conserved objects. Okay, this follows from the constraint Einstein equations and the constraint Maxwell equations. Okay, so, uh, as I said at the beginning, you don't really get a solution for every value of the thermodynamic fields. You get a solution only if the thermodynamical fields, when, pl when plugged into these constitutive relations that give you the stress tensor and charge current as a function of these fields, also satisfy conservation equations. 
And here I've, uh, I've written the conservation equations in generality, which allows violation of conservation of the stress tensor because of background electromagnetic field, because of the Lorentz force law, and violation of charge conservation uh, because of a possible anomaly, a, a possible U and cube anomaly uh, of, the, uh, of the charge current. OK, so now these equations, which from the point of view of, uh, uh, of uh, field theory are sort of trivialities in the sense that they just come from the Noether, the Noether procedure of field theory, within this, this long wavelength fluid dynamical expansion become genuine dynamical equations of motion. OK, because uh, this gravitational procedure uh, allows you to solve for the stress tensor and the charge currents as functions of these fields. There are exactly as many fields as equations of motion. Um, there, there's a temperature field, a chemical potential field, and three velocity fields, so five degrees of freedom, five equations of motion coming from conservation, four from the stress tensor and one from the charge current. This gives you a well-posed, or probably well-posed, that's part of the Clay Millennium Prize business, um, set of partial differential equations that you can use to solve to determine dynamics. And of course, these, these equations, along with constitutive relations of this form, um, are well known. They have a name, they're called the equations of hydrodynamics. Okay, and the precise form of the uh, corrections to the stress tensor and the charge current um, are referred to as uh, involved parameters, as Yaron reviewed in a talk earlier today. And these parameters are called constitutive parameters, this relationship that expresses the charge current and stress tensor in terms of uh, other things um, is called a constitutive relationship. Okay, great. Now, something else that, we will, that will be very important in my talk is uh, as I've emphasized, these solutions to gravity uh, are, were determined to satisfy a particular boundary condition. And the boundary condition was that they have a regular event, future event horizon. Now, there's an interesting fact about all solutions to Einstein's equations that satisfy reasonable energy conditions that, that are satisfied in our system. For instance, Einstein Maxwell negative cosmological constant gravity. And that fact is the Hawking area theorem. Uh, Hawking proved very long ago that, uh, um, under mild assumptions, um, that the area of, a, of an event horizon can only decrease, of a future event horizon, can only decrease, not increase in time. This has a very important, and important consequence for this, this fluid dynamics program. It, it turns out that you can use the area of form on the event horizon, take that, pull that back to the boundary, and then hodge dualize it to get a current and then use the Hawking area increase theorem to demonstrate that this current so constructed uh, is locally of positive divergence. Now, let's give this current a name. This current which is constructed purely geometrically in gravity, let's give it a name, let's call it the entropy current. Um, so this tells us that this program of deriving, you know, of, of obtaining fluid dynamic-like equations from gravity, which by the way is a program that tells you that within a long wavelength sector, the equations of gravity in asymptotically ADS space, uh, within a particularly defined long wavelength sector, the equations of gravity reduce to the equations of fluid dynamics. You get the same dynamical system. Okay? This tells you that this, the, the fluid, dynamics, fluid dynamical system that you, uh, that you get is accompanied by an entropy current, which can also be expressed um, as a local function of thermodynamical fields, and that this entropy current is a positive divergence. Now, all these elements together, constitutive relations for the stress tensor and the charge currents, the presence of an entropy current, and the fact that it is for positive divergence, for a fluid dynamist, all these elements together, co together constitute an acceptable set of equations of fluid dynamics. The co for a fluid dynamist, these constitutive relations, uh, well, the, you know, come, uh, come out of the idea of local equilibration, and... Uh, um, uh, the details of these constitutive relations come from detailed microscopic dynamics, but the fact that they're accompanied by an entropy, uh, by, by an entropy current whose divergence is always positive tells you that the equations that you write down of fluid dynamics are consistent with a local form of the second law of thermodynamics. And since fluid, the equations of fluid dynamics are thermodynamical in nature, this is a necessary condition for any equations that you get. OK, fine. Now, a question that you might ask, and uh, um, a question that you might ask is, uh, 
as you vary over all possible bulk Lagrangians. So the, the calculations relating bulk equations to the equations of fluid dynamics well, well, have most have you know, largely been carried out in the simplest bulk systems, namely, for instance, Einstein-Maxwell gravity. But you might try to complicate your system by adding perhaps neutral scalars that sit behind F squared. You can do all, imagine all kinds of complications of the system. And you could ask, um, while the calculations that you do in Einstein-Maxwell gravity give you particular constitutive relations, if you vary your bulk Lagrangians over all possible complications, what is the set, what is the set of possible constitutive relations that you could obtain by this process? Okay? Now, um, this is, uh, if, if you're a field theorist, you might suspect that the set of possible constitutive relations are just the most general things you can get on grounds of symmetry. You know, you write down an expansion like this, uh, expand pi mu nu and j mu dis in terms of derivatives, put everything that you can on symmetry grounds with unknown coefficients, and this will be the most, most general set of possibilities. This is wrong. This is wrong because this, these symmetric considerations don't take into account the other important requirement, namely the requirement that we have a, a positive di divergence entropy current. And it's interesting how powerful this restriction is, the requirement that you have this positive di divergence entropy current. Um, okay, now I should say that this question, you see, I've worded it in the context of gravity, but it's essentially a question that you could word directly in terms of fluid dynamics. What is the most general co constitutive relationship of fluid dynamics consistent with positivity of the entropy current? And I'm far from the first to ask, ask this question. This question was asked at, at least by Landau and Lifshitz in their classic textbook of, on fluid dynamics. And in the context of non of, that I'm going to be reviewing in the next five minutes, just ordinary charge hydrodynamics, was answered by Landau and Lifshitz. I'm going to give you a review of how they did it with a couple of twists that go, go beyond what they had. Okay, so the next five minutes are a bit technical. Uh, they're the only algebraic things in, the, in, the, in these slides, uh, but they're quite interesting. So I, you know, bear with me and try to don't glaze over. Okay, see, so we've we've got this fluid dynamical configuration. At any point in space, we've got a we've got a velocity vector for the fluid. This velocity vector breaks the tangent, you know, the SO three one, the local SO three one at that point, down to SO three the part of the lo local Lorentz group that commutes with the velocity vector. Now, we're going to try to look at the possible corrections to the stress tensor and the dissipation, dissipative charge current. Uh, I I'm going to present to you the theory of you know, wh what, what could happen at first order in a derivative expansion. So it's very important for us to classify all expressions of first order and derivatives of thermodynamical fields. Okay. So let's let, uh, and it's useful to organize this classification according to the unbroken symmetry. So according to representations of this unbroken SO3. So let's see. In this case, um, we, we get data that is scalar data that doesn't transform under SO3, vector data, and tensor data. The scalar data is very simple. The scalar data is sort of the time derivative of the temperature, the time derivative of the chemical potential, and the divergence of the velocity field. The three pieces of scalar data. However, as in a field theory, you know, the, the, we're looking at data that's correction to the, to the perfect fluid equations. And bits of data that are set to zero by the perfect fluid equations should not be counted as independent. We should be looking at on-shell inequivalent data. Now, we've got two one-derivative equations of motion is the time part of the conservation of the stress tensor and just the conservation of the current. These two equations, plugging in just the perfect fluid uh, uh, constitutive relations, give you two relations between these two pieces of scalar data, and that allow you to eliminate the first two guys, for instance, and to regard del mu u mu as the only independent scalar data formed from one derivatives of velocity fields, of, velocity, of thermodynamical fields. Going through a similar exercise, you can show that after I, uh, listing all uh, vector data and eliminating uh, using the equations of motion, there are three pieces of vector data. This is V1. These pieces are called V1, V2, and V3. Uh, V1 is some linear combination of the, of the derivative of the chemical potential, so sort of the gradient of the charge density, roughly speaking, and the electric field in the problem, the background electric field. V2 is the local fluid acceleration, and uh, V3 is just the background electric field in the problem. 
Okay, in a similar manner, there's only one piece of independent tensor data. This independent, this independent piece of tensor data is called the shear tensor, and is defined here by these complicated formulas, but it's basically just the relativistic generalization of, you know, uh, non-relativistic shear. Okay, how much one, one bit of a fluid slips with respect to the other. Okay. And uh, later on, we'll also need to, uh, for, for what we're going to do, we're going to need to classify the independ on shell independent two derivative data. There are three pieces of on shell independent two derivative data. Oh, you won't need to know what these pieces are for what, what follows. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is to try to, cl uh, try to list all possible constitutive relationships of fluid dynamics to first order in the derivative expansion. Okay. Now, there's something sort of interesting here, and it was alluded to by Yaron in his talk, and uh, uh, that's this. You see, I've been acting as if the velocity field, the temperature field, and the chemical potential field are uh, well-defined field variables. But you see, temperature, chemical potential, and even net velocity are absolutely well-defined in thermal equilibrium. But we start becoming ambiguous out of equilibrium. And fluid dynamics works in an expansion away from equilibrium. So these fields, while they have absolute meaning in equilibrium, are ambiguous uh, at first derivative order, which means that any equations we write down should admit a field, uh, field redefinition uh, symmetry, where the field redefinition symmetry redefines the temperature, the chemical potential, and the velocity fields by terms of first order or higher on a gradient expansion. Now, uh, if you look at my definitions of this pi mu nu and j mu dis, because a field redefinition ambiguity, you know, a field redefinition performed on these guys will change pi mu nu. And a field redefinition performed on these guys will change j mu dis. You see, this pi mu nu and j mu dis are not by themselves field redefinition invariant. Physical things should be specification, should involve only the field redefinition invariants. Huh? And uh, you can easily check that while pi mu nu and j mu dis are themselves not field redefinition invariant, these combinations of pi and uh, the dissipative current are. Okay, so these are the things that are going to be that are going to be specified by constitutive relations. Okay, so the things that need to be specified are one tensor. It's complicated, but it doesn't matter. I mean, exactly what it is. One tensor, uh, one scalar, and one vector. And uh, you remember that the data that we had in our hands was, uh, from fluid stuff was one tensor, one scalar, and three vectors. So if you were guided just by the principles of symmetry, what you would say is that, well, these guys, are, this guy is some parameter that I don't know times sigma mu nu. This guy is some parameter that I don't know times del dot u. And this guy is su summation over three parameters that I don't know times the three independent vectors. Okay. Um, these parameters, here, this parameter has a name, it's the shear viscosity, this parameter has a name, it's the bulk viscosity. Only one of these three parameters has a name, it's the conductivity or the diffusivity, because the other two parameters, as we will soon see, are forced to be zero from the principle of entropy, const uh, from the principle of entropy increase, as I will now explain. Okay, by when I say parameters, I really mean arbitrary functions of the scalar thermodynamic variables, namely temperature and chemical potential. Okay. So, you know, so symmetry gives us the specification of these constitutive relations up to five parameters. Do all these, do, do the equations of fluid dynamics with any of the, any values of these five parameters satisfy the equations of entropy increase? And uh, the answer is no. Now, so what, 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 what we must do is to ensure that there's, a, there's a, an entropy current which is positive divergence. Now, as I said, we're far from the first people to try to ensure this, this condition. This problem was addressed at least by the, uh, at least as early as in the textbook of Landau and Lifshitz. And what they did was something very clever. Landau and Lifshitz, you know, uh, wanted to define an entropy current that would be positive divergence. And they defined something very clever. See, S times U mu is what you would get at zeroth order, but you could have corrections to this entropy current at coming from first order terms, and they chose this particular corrected definition. They chose this particular corrected definition on intuitive grounds. You know, for a deep condensed matter physicist like Landau, he could identify that, you know, heat transfer, for instance, should be accompanied by entropy flow, and similarly, something here. Um, 
But there are many other nice structural features about this entropy current as well. For, for one, while S times u mu is itself not field redefinition invariant, this linear combination turns out to be. It's quite interesting. So it's a very nice uh, uh, entropy current. And then Landau and Lifshitz um, assumed that this is the correct entropy current. And then tried to obtain the equations of hydrodynamics by imposing the positivity of this entropy current, the positivity of divergence of this entropy current. Now, uh, as Garon reviewed in his talk, there are situations in which this, this intuition about what the correct entropy current is, is known to fail. OK? There are many situations in which it's correct. There are some situations in which it's known to fail. And so it's a dangerous assumption. We don't want to make dangerous assumptions that could be wrong, so we're not going to make it. We're going to parameterize. OK, oh, by the way, the other thing that Landau Lifshitz did was to use the equations of motion and thermodynamics to show that the divergence of this, entr this decanonical entropy current takes a very nice uh, uh, form in terms of pi mu nu and j mu dis that's listed here. We'll come back to this. But we're not going to make the assumption of Landau Lifshitz that the um, entropy cur current is canonical. Instead, what we're going to do is to allow the entropy current to be Landau Lifshitz canonical form, plus the most general correction that could appear on symmetric grounds. You could have the one derivative scalar times u mu, and you could have had any of the, the vector terms. Now what we do is take the divergence of the, this entropy current. We get the piece that landau leaf had, plus corrections. Now, everything that we get on the right-hand side is of two derivatives. There are two kinds of two derivative terms you could get. You could get terms that were quadratic, you could get a quadratic form in first one derivative data, or you could get linear terms in two derivative data. Let's first examine the li uh, linear terms in two derivative data as inconsistent with positivity, because linear forms in independent things cannot be positive. So let's first examine the two derivative stuff. So when you work out the divergence and just isolate the contribution of two derivative stuff, you remember there were three independent two derivative scalars. Each of them appear in this divergence uh, with some linear combinations of the unknown coefficients of the entropy current. That, uh, that were listed here. And the requirement that the entropy, divergence of the entropy current be positive forces us to set each of these, uh, this v1, s1 plus v2, and v3, or nu3, or whatever it is, to 0. And that leaves a one-parameter ambiguity in the, in the end entropy current. OK. Now, if this is all we were to do, we would have concluded the entropy current has one-parameter ambiguity in it. But there's another physically important constraint that we haven't yet imposed, and that's this. So far, we've been working in flat space. Now, suppose we took this fluid and let it flow in a curved background, and then redid the calculation of the divergence of the entropy current. It turns out that then we get an additional piece in the divergence proportional to the curvature of this background, and uh, proportional to this one undetermined coefficient. Since this curvature is arbitrary, the background curvature is arbitrary. The principle that you can consistently couple your fluid to a curved space, even if you're only interested in studying it in flat space, determines the additional parameter, and additional ambiguous parameter in the entropy current set, setting it to zero. And this agrees with Landau Lifshitz's impressive intuition. We land bang on on the, on the entropy current. It's specified as a unique thing that could have been consistent with positivity. And then we just redo their analysis. Their analysis as well, they have a nice algebraic form for the divergence of the entropy current. And the important thing in this analysis is that three pieces of data appear explicitly. So del dot u, the, the scalar piece of data, the tensor piece of data, but only one of the vector pieces of data, this linear combination of uh, uh, gradient of the chemical potential minus electric field, appear explicitly in the expression, times the unknown objects which we want to expand in data. Now, this has to be a positive definite quadratic form. And it's an obvious thing that, if you think about for a minute, uh, that a quadratic form of the form alpha x square plus beta times xy is never positive definite if beta is non-zero, you know, if there's no y squared term. But that's the kind of quadratic form we have here, because there's explicit things only if one of the three vectors. So if you had, in this expansion, you had terms involving the other two vectors, you would not get positive definite, definiteness. That means that the this object, the vector part of the constitutive relations, cannot be expanded as an arbitrary linear combination of all three pieces of ve vector pieces of data, but can only be expanded in one of them. That one has a, has a name, it's called the conductivity. OK? So imposing the requirement, so I've written the final answer here. 
This is the final answer for, that's consistent with positivity. Imposing the requirement of the second law of thermodynamics cuts down the number of parameters you have to specify from five to three. So it's interesting that this requirement of positivity or entropy doesn't just give you inequalities. That you would have expected. It should give you the viscosities greater than zero. But it cuts down the number of parameters. This is a famous, I mean, this, this is an all in Landau Lifshitz, uh, but it's interesting. OK, so let's summarize this part. The positivity of entropy production requires that two out of the five possible constitutive parameters vanish. The entropy current is then fixed to take Landau Lifshitz canonical form. The intuition is impressively correct. Uh, explicit computations in Einstein Maxwell theory bear out all these productions, uh, all these predictions. So you use the fluid gravity map to compute the constitutive parameters. You find only these three are non zero. You find the entropy current takes the canonical form. And this had to be. This had to be because it follows from entropy production, which positivity, which Einstein gravity has. But it's interesting. But, but uh, okay, so we've not, we've not messed up somewhere in the analysis. Okay. And I want to emphasize that in order to completely constrain this whole structure, we needed to impose this, this, in, this interesting condition that um, uh, for, of positivity of entropy production, even in an arbitrary curve background. And this had implications for studying fluid dynamics, even in just flat space. OK. Um, the last thing I want to emphasize that will be important for us soon uh, is that of the first five first order pieces of data, um, three of them enter in entropy production. These are turned on, then entropy is being produced. But the remaining two pieces of data, the remaining two vector pieces of data, can be turned on without entropy being produced. They don't, their squares don't appear on the right-hand side of the entropy production equation. Please keep this in mind. We'll come back to it right at the end of the talk. OK. So this was the old stuff, uh, perhaps viewed in a slightly new light. But um, I've presented it in, in a lot of detail, well, firstly, because I think it's interesting. Uh, but secondly, because I'm just going to tell we did more or less exactly the same thing to try to discover things that were not so well known. Okay, and the things that are not so well known is uh, is, is stuff connected with superfluidity. Okay, so it was pointed out by Gubser that sometimes when you take these acid, these Reisner and Nordstrom charged black brains, they're unstable to condensation of charged scalars. Okay, uh, the end point of this condensation is uh, a configuration that. Uh, has under the ADS CFT map and op the expectation value of an operator that's charged under your global symmetry. So, what condensed matter physics is called, called a superfluid. Okay? Um, and you, you get these solutions in which, uh, roughly speaking, the stuff behind the horizon the, represents the normal fluid and the condensate represents the superpart. Now, very soon after Gubser's Observation, it was also realized that these solutions in which you've got this condensate of the scalar field can be generalized to turn on expectation values of the spatial component of the gauge field, constant spatial components of the gauge field at infinity. Okay? So there are three spatial components of the gauge field. You can turn them on at infinity to be arbitrary constants, giving you a total of eight parameter sets of solutions. These three components of the gauge field um, I mean, and the think of the Schrodinger equation, for instance, you know, it's, it's the covariant derivative of the phase of the scalar, roughly, can be thought of as the velocity of the superfluid part of the, of the, of the stuff. OK? So um, we now know that there are these hairy black brain solutions parameterized by eight parameters. The eight parameters are the temperature, the chemical potential, the velocity of the normal fluid, and the velocity of the superfluid. OK? This is just an algebraic statement about solutions of gravity. Now, um, the, the, this, this structure is satisfying because you know it's well known that superfluids in a lab admit exact equilibrium or exact non-dissipative solutions in which the super part moves through the normal part, and that we see in gravity. Okay, now there's a natural question in uh, once you've got uh, you've got this far, and the question is, what is the you know, what is the thermodynamics of this eight parameter set of solutions? And you can ask this as uh, asking, what is the stress sense and charge current of these solutions expressed in terms of uh, these eight parameters? And uh, this question was answered in a very beautiful paper by Sonner and Witter, uh, Witters, uh, students and postdocs in Cambridge at the time, uh, and Imperial College at the time. Um, uh, they, they, they realized using simple generalizations of the usual derivations of the first law of black hole thermodynamics. 
okay? That for these solutions, independent of solving the equations, you could, sh you know, just on structural grounds, show that the stress tensor takes this form, the current takes this form, and, and this is just the definition, the uh, projection of uh, the velocity with this. Uh, this is the definition, so forget that. So uh, the stress tensor and current take this form, where there are many unknown functions here, and I don't have the time to take you through exactly what all these unknown functions are. The important thing is that all of these unknown functions are determined from one, get, uh, one, one partition function. A single object, z, as a function of three numbers, temperature, chemical potential, and magnitude of superfluid velocity. Now, one function determines everything, just like in ordinary thermodynamics, one partition function determines everything that appears, you know, determines density and pressure and charge density and whatever else you want. Uh, and this, this structure was suggested 60 years before by Landau and Tisa in their famous work on two-fluid two super hydrodynamics, and it's the basis for this two-fluid picture of hydrodynamics. Okay, great. So now we understand equilibrium. So now the next question you could ask is, what about dynamics? Well, the whole structure here is going to be more or less the same as before. Okay, um, we've got these conservation equations. We've got these conservation equations, and we also have the condition that this xi nu, which I didn't stress before, xi mu was uh, uh, the covariant derivative of uh, the phase of the uh, uh, scalar field, which is condensing at the boundary. Okay, uh, this xi mu has to be curl free because otherwise that would be turning on a background electromagnetic field. Well, it has to be curl free in the absence of a background electromagnetic field, or that its curl is is equal to the value of the background electromagnetic field. Just because if you plug in the definition, that's what it is. Okay, these are the equations of, of, of superfluid hydrodynamics. All we have to do if we want to get these out of gravity is to generate, you know, solve the Einstein equations and generate constitutive relations for these, these guys um, along the lines that I explained to you before for ordinary hydrodynamics. Okay, so as before, the constitutive relations take the equilibrium part plus corrections. And the interesting question now is, what is the structure of these corrections? Okay. Um, now, in, in a, the, the, this problem is complicated to address technically because it's hard to solve, find explicit solutions for the equations, even for equilibrium. However, in a, some partic not particularly appealing, quite ugly, particular corner of a particular model of ADS-CFT, you know, with particular kind of charge matter, with <laughs> we could do this calculation. And we got some results. The particular model was not, uh, not of any interest. What was of interest is, is, is the following. We get some results for these, these, uh, um, these, co these constitutive things. And we want to check whether they are of the general form predicted by condensed matter physicists. Now, there's this textbook on superfluidity by a guy called Putterman, in which he writes down the general theory of, um, of uh, uh, first order superfluid hydrodynamics. He says, his theory says that these um, constitutive parameters should lie within, within a 13-parameter class of possibilities. We did the calculation. It didn't agree with, I mean, it, didn't quite, it almost did, but didn't quite fit into Putterman's form. OK, so either we'd done the calculation wrong, or there was, some, there was a problem with Putterman's theory. Fine. So in order to uh, clear this up, what we did was to um, what we did was to just independently address the question of what are the most general possibilities for the constitutive relations of superfluid hydrodynamics. Okay, the method we followed was exactly the one I reviewed for you before. Okay, uh, th there are some, some differences in detail. In the, the residual symmetry now is SO2 rather than SO3 because we've got two velocities. And then, uh, because of this, there's much more data. So the Amount of independent data, for instance, in the case that you impose parity invariance, is seven scalars, seven vectors, and two tensors. Okay? Then, just as before, we wrote down the most general constitutive relations allowed by symmetry, imposed non negativity for the divergence of the entropy current, and also imposed a requirement called the, uh, of the Onsaga reciprocity principle, which I don't have the time to explain now. Uh, basically, it ensures CPT invariance of correlators that you compute out of this procedure. Uh, now, this is more or less the procedure that Landau, Lifshitz, and Putterman followed in order to try to get their theory of allowed terms, except that they assumed that the entropy current takes a particular canonical form, and we, we will not allow ourselves to make such, make such assumptions. Okay, so, um, fine. Uh, this, this not allowing ourselves to make such assumptions greatly increases the freedom, 
Because for instance, in the case with parity, the most general entropy current now has 21 additional coefficients. And without parity, 32 additional coefficients. OK, so we plug in this monstrous structure, compute the divergence of the entropy current, and demand that in every possible circumstance, including turning on weakly curved backgrounds, everything is positive divergence. And when you go through it, um, this is what you find. In the case that the superfluid is constrained to be parity invariant, you find something very nice. You find, firstly, that just as in the case I reviewed for you with ordinary fluid dynamics, the entropy current is constrained to take its canonical form. There's no freedom in the entropy. I mean, exactly what Landau, Lifshitz, and Putterman and Clark predicted was the correct entropy current. OK, anything else would violate positivity. However, in the subsequent processing of going from the entropy current to allowed constitutive relations, uh, at least we believe there was a mistake in the analysis, in the early analyses. They missed a parameter. Um, and there's a 14 parameter set rather than the 13 parameter set. Uh, if you allow for this enlarged 14 parameter set of constitutive relations, the results of the specific concrete calculations of ADS CFT fit bang on into this framework. This, this, this mistake, or at least what I believe is a mistake, <coughs> I should emphasize is conceptually not very important. It was just an algebraic mistake. They missed a possible tensor structure. Okay. It's more interesting what you get where, when you allow for parity violation. When you allow for parity violation, there are two new effects. Firstly, even assuming that the uh, entropy current takes its, take its canonical form, um, we get um, uh, four new dissipative uh, constitutive coefficients that, uh, um, that were not considered by Landau, Lifshitz, and uh, Putterman and friends, possibly because they were not interested in par parity violation. More importantly, however, in this case, there are, there's an additional two-parameter ambiguity in the form of the uh, uh, entropy current. The entropy current is not forced to take its canonical form, but it has two parameters in addition. These two new parameters also show up in constitutive relations. So the net set of equations for, um, for superfluid hydrodynamics violating parity, uh, the most general set that we were able to come up with at least, has 20 parameters. And all the calculations that we've done so far within gravity fit within this 20-parameter framework, though they, of course, don't fit within the earlier Putterman framework. OK. And uh, uh, this, this is not an issue of relativistic versus non-relativistic. The new terms have non-zero non-relativistic limits. OK, let me skip this part because I'm getting late. OK, so let me, let me now summarize and then end the talk in just two minutes with the with what I think is possibly the most interesting part of the talk, but is unverified, and so it's just left for a throwaway comment at the end. OK, first the summary. Uh, we've derived what we believe to be the most general set of equations of superfluid hydrodynamics at first order in the derivative expansion. Our results are based on the existence of a positive divergence entropy current in an arbitrary curve background spacetime and in the Ansaga principle. The superfluid entropy current is forced to agree with the landau lifshitz canonical form, assuming par parity invariance but in general deviates from this form with a two-parameter ambiguity in the parity odd case. And finally, our new framework agrees with the results of explicit gravitational computations to the extent that we have tested it. Um, and uh, I don't know anything about this, but it's conceivable that a new constitutive parameters, ones that have not shown up before in the literature as far as we're aware, will have observational consequences somewhere. Fine. Now, let me, in the last two minutes, just let, let, me, let me end with a slightly crazy conjecture. Um, Recall that the possible forms of the equations of fluid and superfluid hydrodynamics are significantly constrained by the requirement of that, that the entropy dec never decreases. By significantly I constrain, I mean the number of parameters reduces. It's not just inequalities, okay? It's sharp equalities. Reduction in number of parameters. Now, we now know in a very clear way that gravity is dual to fluid dynamics. And this uh, m makes you wonder the following. Could the same thing be true of gravity? Could the space of allowed higher derivative corrections to Einstein's equations be significantly constrained? That is, cut down in number of parameters as opposed to symmetry analysis by the same requirement. Now, your first reaction might be, this is crazy. Because, you know, the derivative expansion is sensible only when derivative terms are small. But we know that in ordinary Einstein gravity, you've got positive entropy production. So how can a subleading effect counteract an order one leading effect? So of course, when entropy production is positive in Einstein gravity, the small higher derivative terms cannot change this. However, when entropy production vanishes in Einstein gravity, 
Then there's, then there's a possibility that adding these higher derivative terms tilts the balance the wrong way. Now, you might ask, are there reasonable configurations in which there's something non-trivial happening in the solution, and yet the entropy production in Einstein gravity is, not, is zero? Uh, but if you think about it, we've answered this question in a particular context. You see, remember that just in fluid dynamics, there were two pieces of fluid data, that is, turning on V2 and V3, gave you configurations that were non-trivial, and yet had no, production in Einstein, no entropy production in Einstein gravity. But we have this nice map between fluid dynamics and gravity. So every fluid configuration corresponds to a gravity solution. So we can very explicitly write down solutions of gravity in which the solution is quite non-trivial, but no entropy is being produced uh, in gravity. OK? In, in two-derivative gravity. So now I'm going to make a crazy conjecture, which I really hope is light, right, because I, fi I, I find it very exciting. My conjecture is that the requirement that the entropy remain either constant or increase in situations where it was constant in two-derivative gravity, um, will yield non-trivial non constraints on positive higher derivative corrections to Einstein's equations in exactly the same way that the requirement that of pro positivity of production in entropy yielded non-trivial constraints on the constitutive relations of fluid dynamics. OK, if this is true, I, I have no evidence for this. OK, it's a wild conjecture. But if this is true, it suggests the exciting possibility of an infinite number of completely new, purely low energy constraints on the structure of higher derivative corrections to Einstein's uh, the Einstein theory of gravity, whose origin lies in the fact that gravity has a dual structure. For some purposes, it behaves like a fundamental theory, which is graviton scattering. But for other purposes, it behaves like a thermodynamical theory, when there are horizons. And thermodynamical theories have to obey uh, entropy, positivity of entropy production. Okay, I have no, no, no evidence for this, but somehow this, this possibility doesn't strike me as unreasonable, and it excites me. I'll end my talk with, with this. OK, so Subi's question was that when you, you, when you do the fluid gravity correspondence, you don't get the most general values for constitutive parameters. For instance, eta over s is always 1 over 4 pi. Um, yes, so there are two responses to that question. The first response is that, of course, if you do the calculation in any given model of, uh, in the bulk, you'll get given values of constitutive parameters. OK? Now, if you scan over all possible models in the bulk, it doesn't sound unreasonable that you should scan over all possible consistent models in the bulk. It doesn't sound unreasonable that you should scan over all possible values of these constitutive parameters allowed on general grounds. Of course, in two derivative Einstein gravity, there's this theorem that says that eta by s in many situations is 1 by 4 pi. But when you move away from two derivative Einstein gravity, that's no longer true. OK? So if you scan over all consistent possibilities, it sounds reasonable that you'll obtain everything consistent just from low energy principles. And what sounds really interesting to me about this is that in this process of scanning, you might find that some things violate things that, we have, that have to be true and therefore cannot occur either in any consistent theoretical framework or in the real world. So any other questions that you would like to ask? Well, you, you talk about uh, this entropy density, uh, but uh, entropy density is not uh, precisely defined uh, uh, starting from uh, 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 certain quantum field theories. Yes. So uh, we need, uh, you know, uh, some sense of uh, semi-classicality, right, uh, to define uh, this entropy density. Yes. And what is uh, playing the role of uh, Planck constants 
in, in your uh, case? Okay, it's an excellent question, and there are two responses to it. The response to exactly the question asked, so the question asked was, uh, um, in situations in which fluctuations are non-negligible, entropy doesn't necessarily need to decrease. Fluctuations away from thermodynamics, in, sorry, doesn't necessarily need to increase. Fluctuations can decrease entropy. Okay, now, you see, the fluctuations that you're worrying about map to fluctuations on the bulk side. Fluctuations on the bulk side are quantum gravity fluctuations and are controlled in, uh, by 1 over n. Okay? So, everything that I'm saying strictly applies just to classical string theory. n goes to infinity, but arbitrary alpha prime corrections. Okay? That does not suffer from the, uh, from the possible problems that you're talking about, fluctuation kind of issues. Okay? I should have just add to that that our exp you might have asked the same question to Wald. You know, uh, wh why should he expect a first law of thermodynamics at finite g-string? And the answer there was sort of more interesting, that all terms, whether g-string corrections or alpha prime corrections, as long as they were local terms in the quantum effective action, worked. So there may be more to say than what I'm saying, but at least what I'm saying is true. That this is at least a constraint on alpha prime corrections, you know, setting n to infinity or g-string to zero. Now, the second aspect of your question is that even, um, even, uh, uh, even at n equals infinity, entropy is by, notion, by its very nature and a thermodynamical notion. There's no entropy density operator in a field theory that you can evaluate in an arbitrary configuration. And this I was very careful to take into account in my analysis. Because all I required was that there exists an entropy current that agree with equilibrium, you know, that, that obey, that agree with what you get at the zero derivative level, and is completely arbitrary at higher derivative order. So it's like the C theorem, okay? Or more precisely, like the H theorem, the Boltzmann H theorem. Okay, this H function agrees with entropy in equilibrium, but it's some other function that is constructed to always increase along configurations. So I don't impose some preconceived notion of entropy. I just require the existence of such a thing. And that should be robust. Yes. I have one more question. I'm, I'm not sure whether this isn't the same question asked in different words, but you started off with a bulk interpretation of the positivity of the divergence of the entropy current, namely Hawking's area law. Yes. And whatever constraints you find on the higher derivative corrections to Einstein gravity, shouldn't they have a similar bulk interpretation exactly. in terms of you shouldn't violate Hawking's area law? Well, you shouldn't violate or the wall right. entropy increase. Right. Yes, they should. So all of this, I mean, the last part of this talk is a very roundabout way of, coming, of addressing that question. The question in, in basic terms should be, well, it's really the following. You know, Wald, when he was trying to generalize the first law of thermodynamics, was able to do it for an arbitrary diffeomorphically invariant action. But the question of whether the Wald, uh, Wald uh, entropy form obeys a second law is a fa famously open question. Now, you might, you know, there are two kinds of famously open questions. Those that are true but haven't been proved, and those that you don't know whether they're true or not. So you might have, might have thought that this is obviously true, but, you know, nobody's got down to proving it because it's tough to deal with congruences of GOD6 or God knows what general relativists do in complicated situations. And that's what I had thought until I realized, using this fluid gravity map, that there were several, an infinite number of configurations, as I tried to explain to you, in which... The Einstein part gives zero. So I, think now it's, I now think it's a real question. It's not just you know, something that's sort of obvious. And you have to put. Okay, so um, the final analysis, if what I'm saying on the last part is true, and it may not be, you know, it could just be that just like for the first law, every diffeomorphically invariant theory has a second law. If so, the last part of my talk is wrong, and that's disappointing to me. Okay? But if what I'm saying is true, the final understanding of it will be in the terms that you're talking about. Uh, the, the role of fluid dynamics could then be thought of as just in identifying configurations in which it could possibly fail. 